Thank you. Human beings have done amazingly well over the last half century. In 1950, there were just two and a half billion people on Earth. Today, there's more than seven billion of us. The percentage of people living in absolute material poverty has declined from around 85% in the early 1800s to just around 15% today. Everywhere infant mortality has been going down and almost everywhere people are living longer lives. Unfortunately, all of our success has come at a high cost to the natural world. The number of wild animals on planet Earth has declined by half since 1970. Why do we care about the fate of the remaining golden monkeys in Rwanda? After all, we'll all still be as materially rich if they're gone and live long lives. I could try to make up a rational reason, but for me, after spending a morning with this mother and her baby, and looking at them now, and looking at the way the mother is looking at her baby, her eyes, and the way the baby is looking at the world with that curiosity and that excitement, it touches something deeper in us than rationality. And couldn't we say the same thing about the children of Rwanda? I mean, after all, we don't know them, we're not Rwandans, but we care deeply about them and we, we, we don't want three billion people to continue to rely on wood and to be trapped in poverty. My name is Michael Schellenberger and I'm president of Breakthrough Institute. We're a research organization that's committed to a big goal lift all humans out of poverty, and return more of the earth to wild nature. Over the last few years, we've been focused on a particular question, how humans save nature. And that may sound like a strange thing to look at, given everything I've just mentioned, everything we hear about the environment. And you might even wonder, do humans save nature? And the answer is that we do. And what we've discovered is that we do in a way that follows what until now has been a hidden pattern with specific elements that are really true around the world at different moments in time. And one of the things that we found is that there's a number of trends that are actually going in the right direction on the environment. And if we take the right actions today, the overall size of the human population and our overall negative impact on the natural world could peak and decline, not by the end of the century, but within a few decades. But there's a catch, and that's that we're gonna have to confront some deep-seated fears that we have about the world, and we're gonna to have to confront some important misconceptions. To begin, if there's one thing I want everybody to remember, that only one thing that you get out of this talk, it's that humans save nature by not using it. And this may sound strange, because it seems like we're always using nature in some ways, but what I'm, not, what I'm definitely not saying, and what we have definitely not found, is that we save nature by using it more sustainably. What our research suggests is that we don't save nature by using it sustainably, we save nature by not using it. Well, what do I mean? Well, let's take a closer look. Humans use about half of the Earth, half of the land surface of the Earth, the part of the Earth that's not underwater or under glaciers. Of that half, about half of the human impact is meat, or 24% of the Earth's surface. Another 10% is crops. Another 9% or so is for wood production, and this is Really amazing. Just 3% of the Earth's surface we use for cities and suburbs, for the places that we live. And what's important about that is that now half of all humans, three and a half billion of us, live in cities and suburbs. And this is going to prove to be a crucial part of how humans are going to save nature and how our negative impact will peak and decline this century. And you can see that it's the part of the Earth that we don't use that we leave to wild nature. So let's take a closer look. I mentioned there were three ways in which humans save nature. The first is we save it by not needing it. I, I said before that we save nature by not using it, but we, we only don't use nature by not needing that. Well, what do I mean? Well, many of you know that here in New England, including uh, in New Bedford and, and much, of, much of Massachusetts, whaling was a huge industry in the early 1800s. Mostly we hunted whales for their oil. We used their oil as energy to light up our lamps. And then something happened. Some of you may know what happened around the middle of the 18th century. This cartoon in Vanity Fair magazine, I think, says it better than any. It's, it's, a, it's a celebration. It's a party. You see the whales are dressed up in tuxedos and ball gowns. And um, it's in 1861. And what the caption says is it says, 
grand ball given by the whales in honor of the discovery of oil wells in Pennsylvania. We save nature by not using it. We save nature by not needing it. We didn't need the whales anymore. We had a better substitute. It was kerosene made from abundant and cheap petroleum. And we didn't save the whales by using whales more sustainably. We didn't save the whales by having more efficient lighting to burn the whale oil more efficiently. We saved the whales by not hunting them. This is New England in 1880. There was only 30% of it forested at that time. Most of the rest was farmland. This is New England today, 80% forested. Martha's Vineyard was really a large sheep farm in 1900. Today, it's mostly forested. When you fly over it, you can see the beautiful forest. Yesterday, I saw a wild osprey, several wild osprey. New England and much of the rich world, nature is returning. The forests are growing back. Why? These farms mostly went bankrupt. We mostly didn't need them for their land anymore. We became more efficient at growing more food. We grew more food on less land. We saved all of that nature, allowing the forest to grow back because we didn't need it. Look at this amazing photograph of Hong Kong. Look at this beautiful green forest that surrounds Hong Kong. Hong Kong is only able to save that beautiful nature because it doesn't need it for growing food or for using it for energy. And they've made an incredible city. And people you know, worry, they say, well, if you go to the city, you're alienated from nature. But look, they can walk into nature from Hong Kong. Nature's right there. They have wonderful access to it. And this is an important part of how the human impact on the world will, will peak and decline this century. More of us are going to move to cities, and we're going to return more of the earth to nature and, and, and wild nature in particular. But you may wonder, that sounds nice for Hong Kong, but what about poor countries? What about developing countries? What about all the slums? And isn't this really, we're talking about industrialization, about factories where the conditions are terrible and people are treated miserably. That was certainly my view. 20 years ago, I was involved in an effort to hold Nike and other corporations accountable for their labor practices in other countries, particularly in Indonesia. And it was a successful effort, and um, Nike did make some improvements. But 20 years later, I wanted to go back. I wanted to see what had happened to the workers. Had their lives really improved materially? And I met this young woman. Her name is Suparti. She is from a rice-growing village in the countryside. After high school, she decided she wanted to join her aunt in a suburb of Jakarta and work in one of the factories. And she got a job in a Barbie factory making clothes and cutting the threads off of Barbies, and it was terrible. She was verbally abused every day. She went home crying every night, and she did something extraordinarily brave, and that's that she quit. But she didn't want to go back home. She didn't want to be a rice farmer. She wanted a better life for herself in the city. So she struggled, but she found another job. And she found a job in a chocolate factory. She's become an extraordinary labor activist and women's rights activist. And when I met her, she was very positive about her future. She has two cell phones. She has a motorcycle. She just bought a house. She makes four times more money than the people back in the village farming rice, she's now saving money to send her parents to Mecca, which is a dream of Muslims around the world. This is what's happened. Since 1960, we're growing much more food on much smaller amounts of land. It's one of humankind's most extraordinary achievements with great benefit to the natural world. We use half as much land per person globally to provide our food. That's only possible it's only possible for Suparti to live in the city as long as she doesn't need to make her own food and we're making more food for more of us. Before he died, Jacques Cousteau had a similar vision for the oceans. He knew that the rising human population, rising consumption, would put enormous pressure on wild fish. Wild fish is really the last set of wild animals that we in the rich world still eat. And while fish farming is still early days, it's still a young technology, has a long ways to go, it's going to be crucial to releasing wild fish and returning more of the oceans to wild nature. I mentioned the first way we save nature is we don't need it. The, the second way is that we have smaller families. I mentioned Suparti. Now that she's in the city, she wants that life for herself. She wants the freedom. She's able to date who she wants to date now, able to love who she wants to love, marry who she wants to marry, 
And I asked her about her family history. And her grandmother had 13 children. Her mother had six. And Suparti said, sometimes she wants to have two kids, sometimes she wants to have four. By choice. In the countryside, when you're a poor farmer, you need a lot of kids to help you work on the farm. You need a lot of kids to help you in your retirement. In the city, you can invest more and fewer kids. And that trend is consistent around the world. As women become more powerful, more educated, as they have more income, they're able to, to do more things with their life, choose to have fewer kids. And you can see it right here. Even though the, the overall population has grown from two and a half to seven billion over the last 40 years, I mean, over the last 50 years, you can see here that we don't know what's gonna happen next. You see, there's one scenario where we keep going up, another scenario we go down. Well, what will determine whether we go up or whether we go down? These are two different estimates by two different uh, leading demographers. The high population estimate, the estimate where the world grows up, goes to 16 billion or more by the end of the century, is a world of low energy, wood energy, wood, dung, and charcoal, and large families, mostly in the countryside. A world where the population peaks at eight and a half billion and then declines by the end of this century is a world that looks a lot more like what Suparti is living, where higher energy, smaller families, more development, and more opportunity. We save nature by having smaller families and moving number three, the third part of the three ways in which we save nature, to using more high-tech forms of energy. This is Maisha. She is one of the 900 remaining mountain gorillas left in the world. She, as a baby, grew up in Africa's oldest national park in the Congo, called Virunga Park. When, in 2007, her parents and much of the rest of her group were killed by men making charcoal for energy. Since then, there's been a number of well-meaning efforts to plant trees, to help people in the region burn wood more efficiently, and the situation has only gotten worse. When we visited in December of last year, this is the, a, a picture of the park, an aerial photo that we took high above the park. You can see here the fires, the fires in the park, here, 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 illegal charcoal burning in the park. Why? Because people need it. They need that nature. Just over 90% of the people depend on wood for fuel. We're not, we didn't save the whales by using whales more sustainably, by using whale oil more efficiently. We saved the whales by using a different kind of energy, by using a substitute. This is Suparti. Suparti, like young women who move to the city everywhere, uses propane. What we use as camping fuel, similar to the natural gas that we all enjoy. It's an important substitute for the, the two to three billion people that still depend on wood and dung as their primary energy. Now, propane is a fossil fuel, and what that means is that as the poorest people in the world gain access to modern energy, we're gonna have a lot on schedule to have a lot of global warming. This is from the Nobel Prize winning United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You can see historical emissions, and then you can see in the different colors various possible futures. You can see there are different possible temperature increases. We could go to five degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. We could go under one degree pre-industrial temperatures. It depends on choices that we make today. This is Shanghai. As more of us move to the cities, we're gonna consume more energy. For everybody to live at a moderate living standard, at basic material needs met, the world is going to need to triple and perhaps quadruple the amount of energy it produces from today. If all of that energy is fossil, we're gonna see much more significant climate change. What are the clean energy options? There's not many. There's solar, there's wind, there's a little bit of geothermal, there's hydroelectric dams, and there's nuclear power plants. And solar and wind are wonderful. I've spent much of my professional career advocating for more solar, for more wind, including wind farm off the coast of Cape Cod. But solar and wind alone cannot power Shanghai at night. And there's a lot of exciting developments in batteries, but we are so far away from being able to power cities on batteries. Geothermal is great where it's available, and it's not available in many places. Hydroelectric dams have mostly been built in the rich world. We've mostly dammed our rivers, and even in places like China, many of the rivers have already been dammed. That means that we have to take a second look at nuclear power. 
When I was a boy, my aunt took me every August to Bittersweet Park where we would remember the Hiroshima bombings. I, we would light candles and put them on paper boats and push them into the pond and meditate over war and morality and responsibility. A few years later, I saw a television movie about the aftermath of nuclear war. And in high school, I saw the, the documentary Hiroshima about the horrors of nuclear. I've been, I was anti-nuclear my entire life. And then I confronted this data and the challenge of meeting global energy and development needs and also dealing with one of our most serious environmental problems. And I've changed my mind. And in that time, I've spent a lot of time understanding the technology. Fear is a really important emotion. It wakes us up to the world. It makes us aware of risk. But if we allow fear to drive us, we can end up making decisions that actually put us at greater risk. And so it's important to understand what is scary. It's important to understand nuclear power. This is a nuclear power plant in California. You can see it's a remarkable piece of technology on what is the equivalent of about three football fields and lots of surrounding green nature. It provides power for three million homes. You can see it's built up three times higher than the tsunami that affected Fukushima. There's backup water in case there is a power outage so they can keep the reactors cool. These domes are containment domes, which means that if there's a meltdown, no radiation will escape. And you can see here all around it, natural life, sea life exists because nuclear power is zero pollution. And one of the things we've learned about energy production is that what you want from an environmental perspective is that you want the least natural resource in, the least amount of fuel in, the most amount of energy out, and the least amount of pollution and waste. You can't walk alongside a coal plant and not be affected by the smoke. You can with nuclear. It's a serious issue in terms of pollution, and what nuclear provides is reliable power 24 hours a day, seven days a week to power big cities like Shanghai. What about the accidents? We hear so much about the accidents. And we've reviewed all of the peer-reviewed scientific literature, independently done, and here's what it shows you. The first thing to keep in mind is that four million people die every year from diseases related to inhaling wood smoke. The, the three billion people that rely on wood and dung as their primary energy, four million die from respiratory illnesses. Now this is a measurement of power plants. Number one, the most dangerous form of energy is coal. They look at accidents and air pollution, but the remarkable thing is that all, almost all, basically all the deaths in blue, you can barely see the green line up there, are from air pollution. Petroleum, second best or second worst. Natural gas, an improvement, and nuclear, I push the button, it doesn't come up because the number of deaths is too small to register on this chart. The former NASA climate scientist James Hansen did a study using standard public health science and calculated that 1.7 million lives have been saved by nuclear energy. What nuclear does is it's, it leaves the fossil energy in the ground. We save nature by not using it, by not needing it. With nuclear, you don't need fossil. What about the waste? This is the waste from Pilgrim Nuclear Plant, which provides 14% of Massachusetts electricity. A lot of people fear this plant. A lot of people fear California's plants. This is the waste. It's just, it's sitting there. Um, it's not hurting anybody. It's not going anywhere. Uh, we have a couple, couple of people watch it, and people say, well, but that waste is going to be around for 10,000 years. If that were true, even if that were true, that small amount of waste would be, I would suggest, a, a small price to pay for universal prosperity and returning more of the earth to nature, not to mention the public health benefits of zero carbon power. But here's the thing. That waste is not going to be around for tens of thousands of years. It may not even be around for several more decades. One of the most exciting collaborations right now between the United States and China is to develop the molten salt reactor, one of the, first, the world's first commercial reactors that uses that waste as fuel. 95% of the energy is still in the so-called waste when it comes out. There's no major scientific breakthroughs needed. It's going to be a tough technological challenge, but it can be achieved. Another team led by Bill Gates and another team of MIT engineers are all working on the same thing. There's actually other groups as well. There is a global competition to create the world's first meltdown-proof reactor that also consumes waste as fuel. Let's take a look at the environmental impacts. I mentioned that what you get with nuclear is a small amount of 
fuel going in, a lot of energy coming out, a small amount of fuel and zero pollution. This is, this is how much land we used for energy in 2010. I mentioned that if we want to achieve universal prosperity, universal uh, development by 2050, we need three times, maybe four times as much energy. If it was all from nuclear, the energy footprint would actually shrink. If it were all from renewables, it would grow to be the size of North America and Alaska. So let's do solar and wind, but we can't just do solar and wind and return more of the earth to wild nature. How do humans save nature? I mentioned there was a hidden pattern and it's specific and it is the consistent around the world. It consists in moving people out of their dependence on wood and agrarian poverty, uh, moving away from large families to medium-sized families, choosing to have smaller families, mo access to modern energy so that forests are spared, so that forests can grow back from agriculture. And then you see the final and, and last and important step, moving towards small families, universal prosperity, and nuclear energy. What is this a vision of? Today we use half of the earth for nature. Can we leave 75% in nature? We're gonna need more land for cities, but given current trends, we can drastically reduce how much of the earth we use for wood, crops, and meat production. Can we do it? I think we can. Why am I so confident? Because we've done it before. Thank you very much.